Yes, thank you. I, we, we just did a rezoning uh, of, on Evans Lane for about eight acres, and so we obviously lost some job lands there. Um, and and we, whenever we rezone, right, because we're turning that into housing, are, are we, uh, so we just did that last Yes, Month. council member. So council just took action and approve uh, the development proposal for Evans Lane that includes permanent uh, supportive housing. Yes. I can't remember the acreage, but you're probably correct that it's about uh, eight. eight acres. Yeah, I, I'm, I remember uh, because I had I had a lump in my throat before I said yes to it because I don't I didn't when I said yes, I didn't know how we're going to make up the job losses for those lands that we just lost right in the middle of, of the city. Um, and, and I know that other, in this process here, what, what would happen if, if somebody just bought the land, uh, let's say Open Space Authority, uh, and we don't go through any of this process, what, what happens to that land? In terms of jobs capacity? Yes. Yeah. So. Yeah, so again, so we Wouldn't have we have to make that up somewhere else is what I'm trying to get right. at. Right, so Sorry. our general plan, again, just kind of, it has a jobs to employee resident ratio of basically 1.1 jobs per San Jose worker. And so the general plan has a capacity level that we can achieve that ratio. <clears throat> and assuming we want to maintain that ratio, which is, a, is, is fundamental to our general plan with our regional employment center strategy, we would have to identify capacity elsewhere in, in the city. So if, if let's say we, we reduced um, the job capacity by 15,000 in Coyote through two different actions recently, <clears throat> down to 35,000, if a council wanted to reduce it further or to zero, then it's a matter of looking elsewhere in the city to understand where that job capacity could be placed to maintain the goal of a 1.1 jobs to San Jose worker. And I think just kind of <clears throat> reiterating what Chris said, what's really gonna be important is not just where could they go, because they're, you know, the, you could say, well, we could just build taller buildings, say in North San Jose or, you know, the Monterey Corridor or whatnot. The issue is also the type of jobs. So we're seeing more and more interest in, in, in manufacturing and distribution and R&D. A lot of the type of uses that have a harder time and won't go vertical. And it's a different type of job. It's a job that often will employ people without a college education. So there's a lot of issues we have to grapple with. Can we accommodate that type of job elsewhere in San Jose? And if not, what are the implications of that from an equity point of view, from a fiscal point of view, and an economic point of view? So that's part of the analysis that would have to be done. So it's not just simply just taking the capacity and moving it into this urban village or North San Jose or that urban village. It's also looking at the type of jobs, the type of land we have left for those type of jobs and how it would fit. Okay, well, my main question is, Whenever we remove stuff from you without really going into a study, like we, ha we didn't really go into a study to take away those eight acres is what I'm trying to say. Um, now we have to find a place for them or reduce the 1.1 ratios from what I understood from your answer. Well, let me just add a clarification. So the, the eight acres of Evan Lane actually was planned in the previous general plan yes. for housing. Yes. Okay. Um, and it is in an urban village, so even if it weren't planned for housing, under the urban village framework, ultimately it was planned for some amount of housing. Yeah. There was actually a mapping error in the process of, I'm sorry, you know, I'm admitting a fault on the part, but, but we, we made a mapping area, era, and it was, it was inadvertently changed from um, a, a designation for housing. The housing department had bought that land a long time ago to build a housing project. Okay, well, let me take that, that question off the table. There was 40 acres in North Coyote that was already purchased by uh, open space. Was that designated uh, of industrial? That, that still is designated for an industrial it, park. It, it is. Yeah. And, and so uh, there's no way that open space authority, I think, is going to make it an industrial park. Uh, I'm just thinking out loud here. Um, so are you planning, um, um, you're planning on, on, on moving those, uh, is that, maybe that's where the 10, thousand jobs left is that is that where you no move? no no I mean I think that, that no it, not necessarily I mean, we haven't done with that change of ownership we haven't done a specific analysis determined should we reduce the number of jobs I mean the thought is I think the North Coyote could still accommodate the 35,000 jobs on, on the remaining properties okay so okay but um, 
What I'm trying to say is there could be a de facto rezoning without you even taking a step. By if somebody comes in and purchases it. Yeah, I mean, right. So someone could purchase the land for a use intended other than industrial park. But again, the general plan and the general plan land use designations are for employment uses. So if somewhere else were to purchase the land, be whoever that may be, um, and we anticipated that uh, jobs would not be viable in the near, or medium, or even long term, then we prop the council may want to revisit the allocation of those jobs. Thank you. Thank you for the report, and, and thank you for doing the study session. Thank you. And uh, I want to thank Post and the Open Space for taking me on a tour uh, and uh, looking at the wildlife corridor. I thought it was uh, very impressive, and I understood. I understood the reasonings why we need to preserve uh, this habitat, and I, I really appreciate that. That being said, I'm not necessarily convinced of the the uh, the flood protection aspect of this. I mean, I think you just answered Councilmember Esparza's question: Is this if this was the only thing we did, it really wouldn't have protected uh, her district much? Correct. Okay, so I, I um, but we did tell voters that this fifty million dollars was designated for flood protection, and and that's where I get into a, um, a hesitation. How much of is there an actual um, swath of land that we're looking at? This 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 looked um, this diagram the diagrams that you used and the and the things that you used looked at flooding, but it didn't look at ownership of land as part of this. Uh, pictures that you presented here and I, I'm, I'm we have 50 million dollars that's what we're really here for today really uh, is to talk about how to spend this 50 million dollars and I kind of want to know what areas of the the, the land the lands are must-haves and what areas are nice to haves and what areas are okay develop um, and so the, the, that's the kind of questions I'm looking for to be answered and I don't know if you can answer them, and it may, may be an unfair question for now, but that's what I'm looking for in a spending decision. The, 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 there are a lot of uh, parts to that question. I, I will, I will can, can I interrupt for a moment? Oh. Because I, I know you asked that of the doctor. He's not actually going to be making a lot of spending decisions, and he's only involved <laughs> in one small aspect of that, and that's flood mitigation. Yeah. And you probably heard Andrea describe a lot of uh, purposes of uh, preserving. Yes. And what we also told voters, it was about preventing, for example, water co uh, contamination. Yes. So, so I suspect that a decision about what the highest priority lands are aren't made simply on the basis of floods. So I'm a little concerned this is going down a, a very narrow alley that's going to get us nowhere. Uh, it, do you want to ask the question more broadly of the panel? Would that be helpful? Well, well Mayor, I, I, I appreciate that, but I'm, I'm, I'm kind of trying to get an understanding of how much land is actually needed and, th and that's for what for what and that's the for real flood for for the flood protection okay then we'll we'll focus solely on flood protection okay thank right. you yeah and i was definitely gonna yeah. <laughs> stay in my stay in my lane um purely from the flood prevention perspective the laguna seca is the is the part of that system that offers the most benefit um it already it, it previously was functioning like a natural flood detention basin but because of the way that it's been levied it's lost a lot of that so that's probably the place where you could get the most bang for your buck uh, focus solely on that one objective. Uh, the other parts would also provide benefits, but that's probably where the cost-benefit ratio, if, and I'm very much shooting from the hip here, we have not done that cost-benefit analysis, but were you to do one, that's probably where most of the benefits would be focused from a flood perspective. Thank, thank you. The Laguna Seca is the, the, the area where they had the darkest green, right? Okay. Right, exactly. Councilmember Camus and Mr. Mayor, if I might, um, one of the, the key aspects of, of what's before you is what question are you asking? What we've shown you is a restoration-driven vision that protects a myriad of benefits for people and the environment um, with water and water resources being at the foundation of it. One of the, the problems or challenges that we have is that if you develop the Coyote Valley, and previous development proposals for developing the Coyote Valley looked at the principal 
uh, wetland area that Dr. Collison just described as the mitigation for that development. So that Laguna Seca would be usurped for development impacts, mitigation of development impacts, rather than the green infrastructure that we've just described. So I, we don't see it as what's the minimum amount you need to have a flood benefit downtown. It's what happens to the natural infrastructure when you develop it even partially and you use the primary natural flood infrastructure for development impact mitigation. Okay, I think that that's a little more vague to me. I mean, I'm 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 trying to assess the. Oh, well, let me let me go to a different question. So so assuming that we we go down this path, uh, and, and I really appreciate the fact that I think somebody here wants to take responsibility of maintaining the lands, and I think owes a post. Uh, thank you. Um, and um, I also want to know what our and this may be a question to our legal counsel, what is our legal obligation um, for flood protection once we take on this, this role? Uh, just acquiring property for flood protection doesn't put the city in a position where it's assuming the, the liability for flood protection. Um, and I know we've had this discussion before, and I'm looking at Norma, but um, that's uh, one of the roles of the Water District in our view. And uh, just because we participate with one or many different parties in acquiring property for that purpose doesn't put us in the business of flood control. But you, you know, and, and it doesn't really create any any legal liability. I guess is what uh, I'm saying. That's what I'm looking yeah. for. I I, 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 I don't want to put the city in a position of of legal liability by saying, hey, we're gonna take care of your flood protection, and, and I see us potentially delving into that area with, with going down this path. I just wanna make sure we're not putting our city in harm's way. The other question I had um, uh, is, is the, uh, the, has anybody done a, how many actual acres, the, you know, how big acre-wise is this land that you are looking at? Well, as an implementing force in this uh, partnership, the way we work is we take the analysis that were done by the various parties that were demonstrated by Andrea, and you saw the flow through the mid Coyote Valley area. We are working with willing sellers. So then we do our best job possible to acquire lands within that corridor. So it's very hard to answer your question without knowing how many projects we're able to do. The best way to say it is in the area North of Bailey, both sides of Santa Teresa, Teresa Boulevard, and then west of Santa Teresa, connecting that down to uh, the Coyote Valley Open Space Preserve, where you saw part of that on your tour. Uh, that's sort of, call it priority one, because that's where many of the areas overlap of the wildlife linkages, the flood control, those kind of things. So that's how we work. That area is the combination of the uh, north and mid valley areas, so it's, it's roughly around 2,000 acres as the first top priority areas. Obviously, we don't know if we're going to be successful in that area, so we may have to shift and try to work in other places, but that's the best guesstimate for right now. Okay, so about 2,000 yeah. acres. Mm -hmm. uh, it, 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 has anybody done any financial uh, analysis of how much it would cost to purchase the land? So our best estimate at this time is it's at least in the order of uh, 130 million. Okay, thank you very much, and thank you very much for your efforts here to educate us. Okay, um, I, we're just. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, I was wondering, uh, how much is a acre of industrial land valued at these days? What is what is the what is the if I wanted to buy an acre of industrial land, how much would it be? Uh, if you're talking about industrial land in the Coyote Valley, that's technically not entitled. It's probably just a smidgen over agricultural pricing. Which is? Greg, what do you think? It depends on the yield of the crops, really. Yeah. Um, so. <laughs> <laughs> no, honestly, if you can, if you can make a thousand dollars growing something. <laughs> I won't say marijuana, but. <laughs> <laughs> Industrial has become sort of the bell of the ball from an investment standpoint. So you're seeing more capital on the sidelines looking towards uh, pursuing industrial than you ever had. Um, 
the the price per foot for urban infill industrial land in San Jose is in that fifty dollar a square foot or two point one million dollars an acre standpoint. That that's not Coyote Valley pricing. Um, South San Jose land pricing has you've seen it trade anywhere from ten to close to twenty dollars a square foot, um, which uh, which really hasn't. In, in, in South San Jose, you really haven't seen it jump the way it has in the urban or more centralized core of San Jose. How about like the Edenville area? So, so we have a, because it's pretty close. Yeah, no, Edenville, so that's what I'm speaking to. Edenville yeah. is, is probably in that $15 to $20 a foot, which is $650,000 an acre. Okay, thank you. And has anybody done the, the lost opportunity cost, if you will. How much does an acre of industrial land generate in tax revenue? Um, so we have a, a sense of that analysis. I don't think we've translated it to specifics beyond sort of employment lands in aggregate. That's something that we'd have to go back and study to kind of give you a better accurate sort of interpretation on industrial lands per acre versus the aggregate of employment lands. That, that would be very helpful to me anyway. I don't know if the rest of the city council, but I, I just, just from my knowledge, it represents an opportunity loss, and I want to know what that opportunity loss is as far as potential tax revenues, I'm not even talking about jobs, but potential tax revenues generated um, per acre of industrial land. Thank you very much for this panel and for your time.